welcome to my channel. Today we're going to be talking about three kinds of faith and how to know whether your faith is dead or alive. Let's go. Hey everybody, it's that Sunday School Girl of that SundaySchoolGirl.com. Welcome to the lesson for this Sunday, February 4th. I pray that your week is off to a great start. I know that mine is, and I hope that you had fantastic Sunday school classes on this past Sunday. I hope the learning was rich and your contribution was so valuable because you and I have spent the time preparing by studying the lesson together. I was amazingly excited yesterday to receive messages from different parts of the country where people screenshot the videos that were on in their home or in their Sunday school classes where they're using this video to study and to teach. And then I was just beyond excited about a text message from a young adult in Mississippi who said Sunday school was just so wonderful. It met her right where she was and really spoke to those places that she's been praying about and areas that she wants to be better. And that just really reinforces that Sunday school really is for all ages and it is where we need to be to become better stewards of God's word and have those places and spaces to discuss the lesson. Listen, if you're new around here, welcome. You have just joined the largest cyber community of Sunday school students on the World Wide Web and I am thrilled that you're here. Do me a favor and say hello down in the comments. Let me know how you found the channel. But I need everyone, everyone, yes, you too, everyone to just double check something for me. In fact, I just learned this. I wasn't keeping up on my YouTube up, upgrades and updates, but the little picture in the corner of the Sunday School Girl icon, if you click on her, that will allow you to subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss any of the content when it becomes available. So make sure to do that for me. Again, I was so excited because I think most of you know that I was very transparent at the start of the year just a few weeks ago with sharing the goals that I've laid out before the Lord. And one of those was asking God for more people to have the opportunity to see this video. Uh, we're going to talk this week about faith without works being dead. And so I have the faith to believe that God is going to give us the increase in terms of who sees this video. But I also had to do my part. It's not enough to simply let the goals out there and ask God for that but I am doing my part prayerfully by trying to get this video up earlier in the week so uh, this is uh, a Monday video for you and that's faith and work coming together and as a result what I ask God for seems to be too small I had a goal of 10,000 viewers and I am so humbled so honored that this past week's video was viewed by 12,000 199 people, unique views that were preparing for Sunday school. And so to God be the glory for the things that he's done. And we're going to talk more about faith and works in our lesson this week. Before we do that, the last thing I want to let you know, there are two things. Number one, some of you may have tried to access the app uh, Friday and it gave you a message that the app was down Friday and Saturday. Of all people that caught it, it was my mother who was the first one to say, hey, what's going on with your app? But we've gotten that rectified, so it's back up. If you haven't downloaded the app, it is free in your iTunes or Google Play Store. So thanks, Mom, for loving me, supporting me, and getting ready for Sunday school. But it's back up, and it is updated with this week's lesson. The last thing is mark your calendars for February the 10th, February the 10th at 9 a.m. If you are a teacher of teens, we are going to be talking about preparing ministry for teen Sunday school classes. So that's it. Let's get into the lesson for this week. Our lesson title is Faith Without Works is Dead. The Bible basis is James chapter 2 verses 14 through 26. The Bible truth, James says that our profession of faith must be matched by accompanying action. Our memory verse is verse 17, and the lesson aim is that we will agree with the teachings of James regarding the relationship between faith and works. Repent for those times when our words were not supported by corresponding actions, and revere God with actions that match our faith expressions. All right, raise your hand if you're guilty. Guilty of what? You either read the lesson title or you've heard it and you already said, oh, I know that lesson. That's a familiar text. 
I'm going to challenge you and I hope that you won't just dismiss this as an easy week of study because there is always something that we can learn from God's word. There's a new level of revelation. There is a deeper understanding that he wants to give us as we study his word. It never gets old and it never becomes that familiar to us. So this week, we're in a new book of study in the book of James. And since this is new for us, let's talk briefly about the writer and a little bit about the context that helps us understand uh, why he writes about what he does. Now, the writer James does not specifically identify which James he is, and there were multiple men named James, but it is widely believed and accepted that this was the half-brother of Jesus. Now, I found this interesting. Jesus, the Christ, the man who did so much ministry uh, in his time here on earth, had a half-brother who did not follow his ministry while he was here, but James ultimately became an apostle after he saw the resurrected Christ. So that encourages some of us who may be in ministry, and there are people in your family who are not yet one to the kingdom. Jesus, too, had a brother who it took some time to win him over. And James was one of the chief leaders in the church at Jerusalem. He writes and specifically focuses on practical actions in our lives as we walk out these lives of faith. And really his writing is very, uh, it kind of has an Old Testament wisdom book feel. Uh, the language feels a lot like uh, the Proverbs, if you will, because he's writing and encouraging God's people to act like God's people. There's just a way that we act. And when we show up, we should be different because we showed up. It is about daily wisdom and it's wisdom that only comes from God. And so his pages are filled with commands about pursuing lives that are holy. And he does not make excuses when we don't measure up. So we are still talking about faith. And faith is an essential element in the life of Christian believers. But, you know, faith, and we know it's faith alone that saves us. The scripture tells us this, that we are saved by faith. In Ephesians 2 and 8, we know that. We also know from Hebrews 11 and 6 that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Lastly, we know 2 Corinthians 5 and 7 tells us that we are to walk or to live by faith. But here in this book, James is making an argument that authentic, sincere faith is not faith that's just complacent. It doesn't just sit, but it is alive and it's active and it's seen in our everyday lives. It's seen in how we live. It's not just a confession with our mouths or our bumper stickers but in the things that we do every single day. So we're in the second chapter of James, and it's basically divided in two parts. We're going to be studying the second half, but part one deals with favoritism. And then we get into the second half where we are today, and it's really about faith and specifically how to recognize it. We hear this word, and we have our dictionary definitions of it, and even scriptural definitions, but this actually talks about how we recognize faith. Now, on my personal social media this morning or late last night, I posted um, a picture and it says that there are words that we just think about them and they just go together. And I opened it up. Tell me things that just go together. Now, most of you all are hungry and you're giving me lots of food pairs, but there are a number of things that when we think about them, they just go together. Raggedy Ann and Andy, you know, so it there are lots of things that go together, and that's what we're going to get the crux of this week as we talk about two words that go together, which are faith and work. I was curious, so I did a search last night to see approximately how many Americans identify as having some type of faith. And I found a recent ABC Belief Net poll with Americans ranging from agnostic to Zen Buddhist, and a whopping 83% identify as Christian. And we do see that a lot of people have outward signs and demonstrations to identify as Christians. But what James is explaining is that it's not about that stuff. It's more than just identifying. And what he's going to talk about is three types of faith. We'll see dead faith, demonic faith, and dynamic faith. Now, faith is how we get to Jesus, but what James is not arguing is that works have to be added to our faith that we now have. That would, in essence, negate the sacrifice that Christ made for us on the cross and, again, make us slaves of the law. But rather, what he's going to explain is that genuine faith 
has an output. It has evidence. It has fruit. And that true faith produces something. And that something is works. Works are the output, the evidence, the fruit of our faith. And it's really a balancing act. You can't have one without the other. Yes, that song from, I think, uh, the old sitcom Married with Children. At the end, it says, love and marriage and You can't have one without the other. And that's the same conversation that we're having about faith and works. Now, faith is our trust. It's our obedience in God or to God. Works is really doing something from a place of loving God and loving others. But again, it's a balance that we have to have. So the first kind of faith we see in verses 14 through 17, he talks first about dead faith. And that's a faith that is all talk and no action. And he asks the question, what good is it? What value does it have if you say with your mouth that you have faith and then you do nothing? You're just talking about it and you never do anything about it. I love what the Message Bible says. It says that you learn all of the right words, but you never do. And he gives a very practical example. He'll say, he says that something, a need is right in front of you. You see it. You specifically see someone who is without. They have a need. They've fallen onto such a tough time that they can't even survive from day to day. You see it and you do nothing about it. Uh, We respond. He says, what good is it if you respond, be warmed or be filled? Uh, What good is it if you simply say, I'll pray for you, or if you just speak a word to them or say, be clothed, that's not doing anything to meet that immediate need when it's in your capacity to do so. Um, I think I've talked before about one of my favorite sermons from my late grandfather when he preached a sermon entitled Jesus Incognito. And he used Matthew chapter 25 verses 35 through 40 as his scriptural text where it talked about when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. And when I was in prison, you visited me. And they say, well, when did this happen? And Jesus says that when you've done this to the least of them, you've done it unto me. And he's talking about seeing a need and being a conduit and allowing the love that we have for God to be seen in the ways that we act each day, in the ways that we treat people, even in our workplaces, in the way that we interact with our co-workers, in the way that we interact with our church members, how we interact with our families. That is truly how we know that we have faith and the love of God. I thought this was really interesting. I thought about the fact that when you're talking about this balance, and looking at this great gift that we received through the gift of Christ, through having our faith. And we receive this gift because of what Christ gave to us, which is his life on the cross. But we also have the opportunity not just to be receivers, but to be givers in revealing that life in us to others. And that's revealed through how we give. It's our chance to extend Christ to the world. It's really that opportunity to show the love of God and allow that person who may be in need to experience the love of God again with us as the conduit. And so he's explaining that faith alone is not enough. It works together with our actions. The converse of that argument is that faith without action is useless. Now you've got to note that James is writing to a community of believers. There are people who look like they know what's going on and they look like they're doing all the right things. They have the church look. There is a a couple of my friends and I used to call it the 12 spiritual postures. They knew how to raise their hands and when to stand up and, um, you know, when to look like they were being really prayerful. Uh, They had all of the looks and they claimed to love God, claimed because they were connected to this body of believers. You claim it because you serve in ministry, claim it because you're part of a ministry team, claim it because you go to Sunday school. But what he's saying is it's more than our claim. You don't just claim your faith because you share great Facebook posts or praise breaks. You don't claim it just by those things, but you have to see it in action. Now, I need to give this disclaimer. We can't fix everything for everyone all of the time. But what the lesson is telling us is that when we see immediate need and it's in our power to do something about it, 
That is our faith in action. I recently had a conversation with a friend and we were talking about what it feels like to assist over and over again and how long do you extend that? And I can't always answer that because some of that God is going to have to give you um, the sensing for when enough is enough. And sometimes our meeting the need isn't just fixing it for the person, but it is also a teachable time that we can use to show people how to get to resources, how to gain access to the things to help them be successful. And so that help comes, in my opinion, in a number of ways. But I do believe that when it's in our capability to provide that help, we are to do so. In verse 17, James makes a conclusion about dead faith. And he says, basically, he's telling us that intellectual faith is dead faith. Faith that's just in our heads and not in our hearts can't be obedient because it's just an intellectual relationship that we have with God. It's not good enough because it is not producing. And to be dead means that it has no value at all. And again, it's talking a good game, but you don't see the results in the life of the person based on what they say that they have. In verses 18 and 19, we see the second type of faith, which is demonic faith. Now, I don't know why all of these lessons are reminding me of law school, but I remember taking the LSAT and specifically looking at multiple choice questions and how there would be answers that each had merit or maybe very similar. And you had to sort through to find the right one. Is it this one, that one, either or? Is it both or either or, but not both? And in this case, we're talking about faith and works. And it's not either faith or works. It is both faith and works that come together. I love the way the Message Bible states it. He says, you can no more show me your works apart from your faith than I can show you my faith apart from my works. Faith and works, works and faith, fit together, hand and glove. And he more or less challenges the thought using a hypothetical. He's talking about two people being there with two different thoughts about how this works. One has faith and one has works. One has faith, the other has good deeds. And he's saying that, you can't just have one. And his challenge is kind of the state of Missouri challenge. Show me. That's the show me state. Show me how this works. The way I thought about it was this. So I go to church in Denton, Texas. And between Dallas and Denton, to get to the other side, to get to Denton requires crossing a lake. And there is a bridge to go across the lake. To do this is the equivalent of me standing on the Dallas side of the bridge with an engineer who knows everything about bridges. That engineer has intellectual knowledge. And I say, well, we've got to go to Denton. Let's drive. And he says, well, no, I don't think I want to drive across the bridge today. And standing here, he proceeds to explain to me how the bridge is constructed, what it's made out of, understanding the design of the bridge, what materials were brought in, what the process to build looks like, what the weight distribution is, how, how much it will hold to know everything about that bridge. But when I say let's go, he says, well, no, I don't think I want to drive across today. That's someone who has a full intellectual understanding, but no action backing up what it is they know. That's the intellectual. That's those who know intellectually about God. They know about his word. They may even have an expansive understanding of the scriptures. It's an intellectual faith because they understand historical context and Greek, Latin, and Hebrew can quote scripture, explain everything that was going on and demonstrate a tremendous amount of knowledge. They may even enjoy being in church and participating in church activities, but their faith is only in their minds. It's an emotional and intellectual faith, but not a saving faith, which is the type of faith that leads to a heart change. It leads to obedience. So it could just mean that they have a really good memory, but their brains are not aligned with their hearts. Then there's the other side those who have works and no faith. And there are a lot of people in the world who have works and no faith. They have expansive lists of contributions that they've made, giving of their time, talent, and treasure. We talk about philanthropists who share large sums of money with charitable causes. And there are people who are mentors and they donate their time. They organize fantastic events. They speak encouraging words. But James says, that's not how this works. That doesn't, works don't work apart from faith. Together, they produce. And so you can't just show me everything that you've done. 
For the intellectual, he says, it's really nice that you believe, but hey, even demons, demons who know that their eternal destiny is the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, even they believe demons have some kind of faith. Uh, demons are not children of God, but they believe that Jesus is the son of God and they believe in God and in the deity of Christ. Even they have some level of faith. So you're not exactly separating yourself when you simply believe or have an awareness or an intellectual knowledge. And demons at the end of the day are touched as well in their emotions. And we see that because the scripture says that they believe and it causes them to have a physical reaction. They tremble. And so they have an intellectual understanding and it even attaches to their emotions. But that is not a saving faith. faith. And consequently, to identify intellectually and emotionally will still not give us what we need to access heaven. I like the message Bible of this one. We can't profess Christ and then complacently sit back like we've done something wonderful. So James has reviewed two types of faith at this point, dead faith, which is intellectual and demonic faith that's intellectual and emotional. And he says that those two cannot save. But finally, he brings us to the third type of faith. And he's explaining that this is the only kind of faith that can save us. And that is dynamic faith. And dynamic faith involves our intellect, our emotions, but most of all, our will. It is the synergy in the mind that understands truth and the heart desires and rejoices in the truth. And then our wills act upon what we know about truth. And so it's not simply intellectual or emotional, but true faith is obedient. Verses 20 through 26, he's talking about dynamic faith. For the third time, he tells us that faith without works is dead. Dead meaning it has no value. It gives no contribution. But faith that is dynamic causes our behavior to be different based on what we believe. And then he makes an argument. He's asking, do you need evidence? I'll give it to you. And he gives us evidence using two people, two people who could not be more different. First, he talks about Abraham, who was known as a godly man. He was a friend of God. And then Rahab, who was a sinful woman, a harlot, um, a prostitute who belonged to the enemies of God. Verses 21 through 24, he's talking, the great debater James is talking about Abraham and he anchors his position that faith is accomplished or completed by what it does. And he's talking about Father Abraham, the father of their faith, who wasn't right because of his belief, but his faith was perfected in his actions is what the lesson tells us. And you remember that Abraham was asked to sacrifice his son, his promise, the thing that he had prayed for. He was told to sacrifice his son and he was given that instruction and he didn't push back at all. He made ready. He started to gather the wood and to make the transition, to move up the mountain, to go and prepare to make the sacrifice. And he had his son that he had to bind, uh, tie him down to make that transition. And his son recognizes that dad is getting everything that we need to go up on the mountain and sacrifice. I've seen him do this before, but, uh, Hey dad, uh, where's the ram? I don't see the ram. And Abraham's response was, the Lord will provide himself a sacrifice. And although God did not require his son, he gave him the sacrifice in the thicket. Abraham trusted God to the fullest extent, and he was willing to go all the way. And he never stopped believing. His faith never stopped believing that God would provide. And the Lord did just that. The second example is Rahab. And again, a very different kind of story. Um, and Rahab, by her actions, demonstrated what it was to be right with God. Rahab was a prostitute. So that's a wow. Again, someone that we wouldn't just identify with as being a great person of faith. But it was the balance of her faith and her actions. She was a prostitute in Jericho. And if you ask any little girl what they want to be when they grow up, typically the answer is not, I want to be a prostitute. So we know that ugly things that happened in her community and around her to the extent that she was a young woman who ended up in a deplorable lifestyle. And you would ask, how could anything good come out of a second class citizen's life? 
there were spies who had come into the city sent by Joshua and it was their attempt to collect information about how to conquer the city that was fortified and word got out that the spies were there but this woman this prostitute Rahab hid them in her home and she allowed them or helped them to safely get out of the city she risked her own life and that of her family she didn't know anything about these men she didn't know if they were going to come in and take advantage of her as well but she she risked that and exercised her faith in hiding them. And ultimately, Rahab is mentioned not only as a woman of faith, but she's even named in the family tree in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Abraham and Rahab did what they did because of what they believed about God. Real quickly, this lesson reminded me so much of the fig tree in Mark chapter 11, verses 12 through 25. You may remember on one of his journeys, Jesus was walking and he was really hungry and he saw a fig tree up ahead. And based on the external appearance, he could see the leaves, the foliage. He expected there to be figs for there to be fruit on that tree. But when he got there, it was all leaves and no fruit. And that is really what this lesson is telling us, that we can't be all leaves and no fruit because Jesus was so disappointed with that tree for not producing that he used his words and he pronounced doom on the tree. He cursed that fig tree. It wasn't because the fig tree produced figs that it was alive, but because it was alive, it was supposed to produce. And that's how our faith is. Because it is alive, it is supposed to produce. And our faith without works is dead. It's our faith that reveals the heart that we have and that our hearts have been transformed by God. And our faith produces fruit in us. It demonstrates that we are a new creation and not a repetition of the same old patterns and of old simple behaviors. Here are my key learnings from the week. First of all, three times in this passage, James emphasizes faith without works is dead. And dead means it has no life. It has no value. It's good for nothing. So it's not either or. It is absolutely both. So the challenge is what type of faith do you have? Do you have dead faith that attempts to substitute works for faith? Or do you have an alive faith that is producing? Are you talking about it? Or are you also being about it? Do you have a demonic faith that's only in your intellect and in your emotions? Or are you that dynamic faith believer who is doing something active as a result of what you know and believe about God? Your faith is a result of your emotional, intellectual, but most of all, your will being conformed to the obedience of God. Secondly, I love what the Message Bible says. It says, God talk without God acts is outrageous nonsense. Our faith alone saves us, but our faith is not alone. We can't just believe the right things and feel the right things, but we have to use faith and works as partners. Again, I kept thinking about the song uh, from the Love and Marriage show, You Can't Have One Without the Other. The third thing is that faith causes us to act from a place that's authentic and the reality of our understanding and the respect for what Jesus Christ did for us is what fuels us to move and to act in ways that bring honor to him. Works done with no faith don't have the spirit of God. So it is possible to have a long list of things that you do and not have the faith working in your life. Our faith moves us to faithfulness and we are the conduits through which the love of God is shown and it flows. It is our delight in the Lord that drives our discipline and not our discipline that drives our delight. In other words, we don't do to make Christ love us, but we do because he first loved us and because we love him. The big headline is that our walks should match our talk and our works should match our words. This is the lesson for this week. I can't wait to hear what you got out of the lesson. So feel free to share your nuggets, your tidbits, your teaching points for the week. I'm going to get out of here so you can enjoy the rest of your day. Listen, have a fantastic week and I will see you in Sunday school. Bye everybody.